Today's reading is from Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Amen. Okay, welcome everybody in the room and those who are watching. Isn't it a beautiful day? I was walking outside and it was just stunning earlier. So, the last few weeks we've been looking at living a three dimensional life up our relationship with God and in our relationship with those that are in our church community. And today we're looking at out our relationship with those that don't know Jesus. And I wonder what you would score out of 10 if you were going to mark yourself. How strong are you at up, in and out? And maybe that's something that you can talk about with your connect groups, uh, in your accountability groups later on. So the passage that we've just read, the headline says, the workers are few. I think we can say that today too, don't you? And then later on it says, the harvest is plentiful. And again, I think we can say that today. There are many, many people who are hungry and in need for Jesus. So why is it important for us to share our faith, our story, the good news that's changed our lives? Well, in the text we just read, it says in verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. When he preached, he went out to them. He didn't stay or wait for them to come to them. He didn't leave anyone out, showing his disciples and us that this is for everyone. And the next chapter after this passage, the heading is, Jesus sends out the disciples. He sends out the 12. And then in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, Jesus commissioned his disciples. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. So 2,000 years later, we're reading this command he's given us. This was a group of fishermen. No education, no training. He used ordinary people, Peter and John's. And today he's using ordinary people like you and me. And I think sometimes when we think about sharing our faith, we think of the TV evangelist or the street person or the, the vicar or the people in the staff. And there'll be many people who've got barriers Many of us, we're worried about saying the wrong thing or that we haven't got the right Bible knowledge or we're fearful about what people will think. But I believe the Bible's saying to us that this is for all of us to do. Our mission fields, our workplace, our school, that's our context. It's the Great Commission. This is for everyone to do. This is an important part of being a community of radical disciples. And some of us will be natural evangelists. I'm a natural evangelist. I don't particularly like standing here. I like being out there on the fringes. And I'm one of those people, if I find a shampoo that's amazing, everyone will know. If I've you know, watched this incredible Netflix series, everyone will know. If it's rubbish, everyone will know. And um, a couple of years ago, Gareth and myself found uh, an amazing campsite, and I did Gareth's head in, because I told everyone about it, and he's an introvert. And at New Wine, it's exhausting, and we end up at the campsite or the holiday that we're going to go to. Anyway, to Gareth's horror, people were rocking up at this campsite, because I told them about how amazing it is. Now, if you're a natural evangelist, that's great but it doesn't mean that the rest of us sit back. And, you know, there are many evangelists, you know, in our church, you know, go and hang out with them, learn from them. Michelle, 
who's on my team. She's extraordinary. I'm learning from her. I mean, honestly, she's like a powerhouse. But it will look different to all of us how we share our faiths. You know, you've got a different personality, different gifting to me. But we let God do the work. We take the risk. We need to stay away from being cozy in our church comfortable setting. And we need to go out. That's where the lost are. Jesus said he would make us fishers of men. If we really believe that God has changed our lives, we should be shouting this from the rooftops. In verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. They were worn down and exhausted, and I think that describes a lot of people today. We need Jesus to come and restore us, and many people do too. In Mark 12, 31, Jesus said, the most important commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God and loving people are his greatest command. When we love people, we show love to them. We're called to love people into the kingdom. Sorry, my piece of paper's got stuck and I don't know how to get it undone. It's coming. I'm completely stuck now. You can all think about how you're going to uh, love people while I do it. I'm here. So when we love people, we need to really do it in an unjudgmental way. We need to meet people where they're at. We're all broken. They're not your project. They'll see through that. We need to love without an agenda, unconditionally. And that's how we're going to show Jesus. Let's love people through this hard time of COVID. There are so many people out there who are lonely, who need God's love. We're not going to attract people if we don't look any different to them. People are quickly will see hypocrisy. Wherever we've lived, Gareth and myself, we've always caused a little stir. The neighbours have asked questions because we look a little different. We look a little bonkers. Our house is like a train station. And that's great. People ask questions. They want to find out more about us. When we lived in Sheffield, some of our neighbours who lived across the road were obviously watching and our car got broken into. And I went outside to say thank you to them for, for clearing up. And she said to me, she said, Lizzie, she said, what happens in your house? She said, there's so many people coming in and out of your house. She said, are you swingers or are you drug dealers? Honestly. And, you know, it was a rough area, but it wasn't that rough. And, uh, and I, said to, I said, no, we're, we're Christians and we, we hang out and we love eating and sharing our home. We have some groups. And she said, um, well, when is this group? And I said, well, we've got one tonight. And she said, well, can I come? And I said, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, of course you can. A bit kind of shocked. I said, yeah, yeah, we've got one tonight. Anyway, she rocks up and she absolutely loved it. When the group had finished, she ran over across the road and she got a husband and she brought him to the house. And she said, Lizzie and Gareth have, have talked about prayer and that it works. And she said, um, well, he's got a headache. So can you pray for him? And I was like, oh, my goodness. I've got it. Oh, Lord, you better turn up, you know. And um, I prayed. I had a mustard seed of faith, a mustard seed. And his headache was healed instantly. And then she said, right. She said, tell, go on, tell, tell them, tell them. Why have you got a headache? And he proceeded to tell us that he owned a pub in Sheffield and that it was causing him a lot of trouble. It was in a rough area of Sheffield. And she said, 
go on, can you pray for that? We, we've been trying to sell it, and we want to get rid of it. Can you pray for that? And again, Gareth and myself had a mustard seed of faith. And I was like, oh, flipping out, Lord, you better do this, you know. And um, we prayed. The next day, someone came into his pub and offered him a cash offer. His pub was sold. People watch. Let God do the work, and he can do extraordinary things. So how do we connect our Christian life with the outside world? Well, in verse 36, it says, he saw. It begins with seeing. And the only way we can really see others is getting our eyes off ourself and onto Jesus. So we can see what he sees, the lost that need him, the harvest. And we can only have God's eyes and his compassion and his unconditional love if we're in relationship with him. We need the Holy Spirit. If we let God in and let God love us, we then can love others. And you know, I'm 46, 45 actually. Am I 45? 46, 45, always forget, try and forget, 36 maybe. Anyway, the key is falling in love with Jesus. The more I read, that's the key, and everything else flows out. I have my fears, I have my insecurities, I worry far too much about what people think of me. I'm getting better because I'm getting older. But what I do find is, once I take my eyes off, off myself and put them onto him, that's when I see the Lord turn up. You know, I don't really like standing up at the front. I'm obeying him right now by doing what he's telling me. He's keeping our eyes on Jesus. And that's when it gets really exciting. That's when you'll see remarkable things. And you know, Gareth and myself have got it wrong. We make mistakes, but we keep trying. We keep going. And I promise you, you will see remarkable things because God is so big. We have many stories. One of my favorite stories is when we planted our last church in Glow, um, in Offerton, called Glow. <laughs> and um, God loves Offerton. And uh, I ran a charity and a drop in. And people would come in, and uh, we had a garage uh, that had baby clothes. And uh, two sisters walked in, and they wanted, one of them wanted some goods from this garage. And um, I asked the other sister, I said, what would you like? And she said, I'd love a sewing machine. Now, the week before, I had um, been in the drop-in center, and someone had come in, and they'd come in with a black bin liner, and they told me that it was a sewing machine, and usually we didn't take in that kind of stuff in our garage because we got all sorts of junk, and we just keep, had to ask, just keep it baby stuff. But I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit, and him say, Lizzie, just keep this. And I just thought, well, if I've got it wrong, if I've heard him wrong, I'll give it to a charity shop. So I put this black bin liner, which had a sewing machine in the back of the room. And so I was able to say to her, yeah, I have a sewing machine. And I said, I don't know what it will be like. I haven't opened it, but here it is. And she opened it, and it was the exact one that she wanted. I was then able to say to her, this is who Jesus is. Jesus loves you. This is a gift. I didn't care. She thought I was bonkers because I was on a roll. Oh, my goodness, the sewing machine. This was for her. She then started coming to the drop-in center. She then started coming to the mums group, the teenage mums group I ran. And then she started coming to church. She brought her boyfriend. We started seeing her life change. Gareth had the privilege of marrying her and her boyfriend were godparents to their kid. It was beautiful. God does extraordinary things in the ordinary. In verse 37 to 38, it says, Jesus instructs us to pray for the lost and send out our workers. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. 
We need the Holy Spirit to guide us to see the harvest. Prayer is key. No mission is successful without prayer. And it's not rocket science, is it? It's one of the most powerful tools we have. One of my friends, her granny prayed for her for 43 years. And she became a Christian. I've been running around Media City, praying since we planted four years ago, and I'm starting to see God open doors. It's amazing. We need to be asking God, who's my person of peace? Who's the friend? Who's the dog walker? Who's the work colleague? And a person of peace is someone who welcomes you, serves you, listens to you. Luke 10 talks about it. You can dig in more into that. Once God's shown us the person of peace, we pray and then we act on it. God does the rest. By simply loving people, this can open many doors to disciple them. And we'll all know someone who doesn't know Jesus. And sometimes I think we can make it more complicated. Friendship evangelism is so powerful. I need a friend. Everyone needs a friend. Let's be a genuine friend, authentic friend that goes the distance, not a project, not with an agenda. And there's so many ways that we can do that, isn't it? To start putting your neighbor's bins out, baking a cake, and the list goes on. Mother Teresa, I love what she said, let all of us who meet each other with a smile, for the smile is the beginning of love. Let us all meet each other with a smile, for the smile is the beginning of love. We're called to love those who are not like us too, not in our networks. Jesus had a lot of time for those that we find harder to love, the sex workers, the tax collectors. Are you open to loving those people that are not like you? At our pamper afternoons, we have many of the women who come in and we have great fun, but sometimes I've been shouted at, I've been spat at. And the Lord says, keep loving them, Lizzie. You know, we've been doing a pamper afternoon because of COVID, we can't, so we're setting up a phone buddy system. That's because we want to love them, we want to show them God's love. And Gareth, myself, when we were in Hong Kong uh, last year, we watched Jackie Pollinger and her team love sacrificially. She was 19 years old when she went over. She's 70 now. And there was one guy that we met that had been to her place where they loved the sex workers, the drug addicts. And he'd been there. He'd run away 17 times. And Gareth and myself had the privilege of meeting him And now he's an incredible, incredible missionary out in China. Don't give up. Some may not want to hear the good news. In Luke 10, it says to shake the dust off your feet to those that don't welcome you. But I believe that doesn't mean that we stop loving or stop praying for them. One day they might want to hear the good news. Sharing our faith can feel really daunting and intimidating, but Jesus called us to do it, and he'll equip us. He promised that he would give us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. We have no excuse. He will equip us. He is the Lord of the harvest. He's the boss man. Evangelism through the power of the Holy Spirit is so powerful. And we need to trust God for the supernatural. Let the Holy Spirit lead. Are we willing, am I willing to be interrupted for God's kingdom? Because this will not always fit into your schedules or your sphere of friendships and networks. It's our job to introduce Jesus, but it's his job to save them. All we have to do is take the risk, and he'll take it from there. In our lives, Gareth and myself had random plumbers, hairdressers that we've prayed for, and it's been a buzz. And again, sometimes we haven't done it. Sometimes we've made a mistake. 
And sometimes we'll never see the people that we share our faith with. And when I make the excuse that I'm not sure I want to share my faith, I'm always reminded of a guy called Tom. Tom turned up at our church in our last church plant, Glow, because an AA man had told him about Jesus. His car had broken down on the motorway, and he'd fixed the car for him. And then he shared about Jesus. Now, this guy, a guy, probably doesn't know today about Tom and about that Tom turned up at our church, but he took that risk. We may never know. And sometimes we'll miss those opportunities to share our faith because we're not tuned into the Holy Spirit. We're stuck in our own routines. Or we have our eyes on our phones. And sometimes we need to look up and see what's right in front of us. Sometimes we need to think outside the box and get creative. And as we spend time with Jesus, as we get in tune with the Holy Spirit, he'll nudge us to share our faith. Now, he not only shared by teaching and preaching. In verse 34, it says he healed every disease and sickness. And this is not for us just to read in the Bible right now. It's for us today. And I think we need to pray for this more. I think we'll grab far more people's attention. Can you imagine if you prayed for someone in your um, office and they got healed? I think it would get their attention. A few weeks ago, a friend of mine, a little boy, he hurt himself, and um, I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit to text and to pray, and had a mustard seed of faith, but he was healed. Sometimes I've prayed, and it hasn't happened, and I don't understand it. I don't think we'll ever understand properly until we get to heaven, but I know that we're in a battle, and there are times when I've prayed, and I've seen people healed. Let's take that risk. And not everyone will respond positively to our story or to our invite to Alpha or to pray for healing. I remember a time when I was in Sainsbury's and a lady had a a bandage on her elbow and I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit to pray for her. And there was a massive queue. And I was like, really, Lord? And I just kept feeling like, you know, when your sort of heartbeat gets stronger and I was Oh my goodness, okay, I'll just say it. So I said to her, can I, can I pray? You know, I see that you've got a bandage on your elbow. And, and she literally went, no. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I just felt so embarrassed. And there was a whole queue. And then I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit again. And he said, well, tell her that you're going to pray for her at home. And I thought, really? I was like, I feel really stupid already. And I just took that risk. And she literally said, do not pray for me at home. Thank you. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Thanks, Lord. I feel really stupid. And everyone was looking at me. But as I left, the Lord said to me, Lizzie, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what seed you've sown. We need to take those risks. Sharing our faith does come at a cost. We will sometimes get rejected or laughed at or feel a little stupid. But when I read about my brothers and sisters across the world, I don't think that's much. The persecution I've read and hear about for our brothers and sisters across the world, this is nothing really compared to them. We're all called to share the community that we have, the friendships that we have. And when non-Christians see a healthy, vibrant, authentic Christian community in action, it blows their mind. Sharing your home, being generous with what you have speaks volumes. We need to extend our tables, invite people in. And I know that looks different now with COVID, but let's be creative Let's not use that as an excuse. Go for a social distance walk, have a coffee with them, run with them, pick up the phone, make a meal, make a card, plan a Zoom quiz, a murder mystery quiz, invite people in. Let's be generous with what we have. 
We make so many excuses. I'm not gifted that way. I'm not confident enough. I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I'll do it when I have the time. I'll do it when I'm married. I'll do it when I have a bigger house, when I get a bigger table, when I've decorated, or even now, when lockdown is over. We just need to do it. There'll always be an if. I'm running with my neighbors, and it's a great opportunity to get to know them. A number of us I know have started WhatsApp groups when lockdown started, and that's been extraordinary to watch the doors open and be able to show acts of kindness. Acts of kindness, random acts of kindness are so powerful. There's so much that we can do. Let's be a church that extravagantly, outrageously loves. And I promise you'll have so much fun. And, you know, I love Netflix, but it is more fulfilling than binging for hours on Netflix. Let's get together, get your connect groups, let's dream, let's get your friends together about what we can do. How can we love our communities? Let's start praying. Alpha, we'll keep banging on about it, about inviting people to it. It's an amazing opportunity for you to invite your friends. Simon and the team work so hard in putting it on. And as a church, we'll keep putting it on because we want to be outward. We don't want to be inward. We want to be outward and be missional. We will keep asking, who have you invited? Because we believe this is the good news that we have. We don't want to just stay cozy in this church. We want to go out. Bags of Hope is a really simple idea. People love doing social action, but it might start a conversation about Jesus. Try it. Very few people will come to church on their own. We've got to go out, just like it said in that passage. Jesus went out to all the villages and the towns. He didn't stay and wait for people to come to him. And once we know the person of peace, let's go out to them, build that bridge, hold their hand. And it does take time. We've just been praying about being patient. When loving the people that God has called you to, ask God for the right timing to share your story. And I'm not talking about a PowerPoint Christian jargon Right, you know, I'm talking about your story, your real authentic journey, because that's what people want to know about you and being vulnerable and your stories and your testimonies of what Jesus has done in you. Jesus might not be calling you to be a missionary outside, across, over the world, but he is calling us to be a missionary outside in our mission fields, which is our workplace, our schools, our universities, our neighbors, when we're walking the dog, when we're in the shop. The workers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. Let's today choose to be one of those workers. Let's pray. For those of us in the room, should we stand? Let's just posture ourselves to be open to him. If you feel comfortable, maybe open your hands. And those who are watching, you can stand, sit, lie. You could if you wanted to here too. (laughs) Not putting any pressure on. When I was preparing for this talk uh, and praying, I just saw lots of eyes. Uh, And I just saw the Lord um, pouring like saline solution into our eyes because our eyes have maybe got a bit weary, maybe a bit tired, maybe they're shut. Maybe they need resetting. But I felt the Lord's just pouring uh, water in our eyes so that we can see like him. So Holy Spirit, come. Fill us right now. Thank you that we are all called to be missionaries for you to share this great news. 
what's changed us. Give us boldness and confidence, I pray. And I believe there's some who are doing this and, and just feel really weary. And I just feel the Lord just wants to refresh you. If that's you watching or you in the room, he just wants to refresh you. That, and just, it just, he's just so proud of you. But there's some of us that he just, he just wants to just reset. Just let us see how he sees so that we can go out. Come, Holy Spirit.